Hi, I'm Mark Asquith, and I'm at Book Market in Whitby, Ontario, at a lovely curling rink. I have to say, this is the first time I've done <laughs> interviews at a curling rink. With me now is Ira Nyman, who is the author of the Transdimensional Authority series. That, that's a mouthful. I had to write that down. <laughs> uh, so tell me wh why. How would you describe it? Well, the basic idea is that travel between universes is possible in, in the wider multiverse, but um, as we find out in the first novel in the series, if you allow people to travel willy-nilly between universes, bad things happen. So there is this organization, the Transdimensional Authority, which polices travel between dimensions. We've heard a lot of the multiverse, this phrase that gets thrown around. So first of all, how real is this scientifically? Um, almost entirely not, <laughs> yeah. Um, but one of the things I find is that you don't actually have to believe in something to write about it, right? So um, it's theoretically possible, according to quantum physics theory, that there might be other universes. Um, and, you know, the general theory is that they would branch off every time some individual makes a decision. So if you think about how often we make decisions, and then multiply that by six billion people on the planet over the entire history of the universe, uh, you can see that there would be a lot of universes to, to populate the multiverse. Um, but, uh, as I say, even though theoretically it might be possible, I don't really believe that there is any scientific basis in traveling between them. So even if there was a multiverse out there, we would never know because we're kind of stuck in our own. Um, but what it does for me is it allows me to explore ideas about how the worlds that we're born into and the choices we make within those worlds of what we have, um, those two factors go into making us the people that we are. So in the first book, the main character, Numi, who is a transdimensional authority investigator, um, she travels to four different universes where she meets different versions of herself. And um, they uh, illustrate how her life would have been different if, A, she had been born into a, a different universe. In one case, um, it's a universe at war, so she's a military person because those are the only options that she really had. Um, in another case, she meets a version of herself where she is married and has two kids, and she's quite happy with that life. And when the two uh, Numis start talking, <clears throat> she begins to realize that they both had a crush on the same guy in high school, but one of them dumped him and the other one married him, right? So that was her choice, and that's how her choice made her life different, right? So the multiverse concept gives me um, a playground where I can play with those kind of ideas. And how does this play into the fact that a lot of these books are comedy and there's a lot of humor in the books? So does the multiverse allow you to make uh, topical and satirical jokes? Um, yes, actually, because as I point out to people, when I had my conversion experience as a writer when I was like eight years old, um, I decided I wanted to write comedy. Right, so comedy is the through line of my writing career, not speculative fiction. Um, but what speculative fiction allowed me to do was within that sort of comic framework, speculative fiction gives me metaphors and tropes that, that I can play with and exploit for comic purposes. Now, in the history of science fiction and fantasy, there's very, very few people that are able to find humor in, in, with that genre. Um, I, I'm probably two hands, maybe 12 names that I can come up with, R.A. Lafferty and um, Terry Pratchett. Um, so, uh, you know, and all more obvious ones like Douglas Adams. But within that, do you think that there isn't a lot of humorous uh, fantasy and science fiction because they are a tough um, combination? Or do you think it's just very hard to do both things? Well, okay, so I have two somewhat different answers to that question. The first is... We're, we can, we're dealing with the multiverse. You're allowed to have more than <laughs> one answer. That's how this works. Um, there was a story going around a couple of years ago. I've heard this... I first heard it at a science fiction convention, and then I, I heard it again on uh, John Scalzi's blog. He wrote about this. Um, 
the story goes that a person who has a, a humorous science fiction novel goes into one of the big science fiction publishers in New York. Hey, I've got a humorous science fiction novel. I'd like you to publish it. And uh, the editor at that place goes, yeah, we already have the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. We don't need any more. So there is this feeling among some publishers that we don't need it, right? So there is this resistance in publishing. But what I will say is this. Um, the way I approach writing is that humor is drama plus, right? So a humorous novel needs to do all of the things that a regular novel has to do. It has to have interesting characters, it has to have a plot that makes sense. And on top of that, it has to be funny, right? Humorous science fiction is drama plus Plus, now you have to have all of the dramatic elements, you have to have all of the comic elements, and then you also have to have the tropes of science fiction, fantasy, whatever it happens to be, right? So now you're juggling three different balls. And yes, I can see that for many people that would be difficult, right? Especially if you come at it from a science fiction angle rather than the humor angle. So. You know, I had a lot of humor writing before I started writing science fiction, so by now, hopefully, I've got the humor down. And now that allows me to know, you know, be comfortable that my humor is going to work so I can concentrate on the science fiction aspect of it. So let's talk about the, the early comedy work that, that you did. So, first of all, what attracted you to comedy? You said at the age of eight, you basically wanted to know that's what you wanted to do. That's kind of extraordinary. I've, I've thought about that a lot. What was it? So... Um, like many humorous people, I had kind of a um, unhappy childhood, I would say, very fraught uh, relationships with my parents. And, you know, looking back at it with hindsight, I think that one of the things that really attracted me to humor was that it made me feel good, you know, and it made me get away from the pain of my childhood. And I hope that part of the reason why uh, I decided to pursue a, a career in writing comedy was because if I could do that, maybe I could make my parents feel good and maybe I could ease the, the sort of tensions around my home life, right? And then, you know, later on, um, uh, I used to write for a magazine called Creative Screenwriting back in the day and um, uh, after 9-11, which tells you how far back this goes, right? After 9-11, we got a, uh, an email from the editor, Eric Bauer, saying, I'd like to do a special magazine, a uh, special issue devoted to um, the purpose of the artist in times of crisis, right? So I wrote a piece for them called um, Laughter is Always Appropriate. I talked about how my father laughs at funerals and um, how a lot of people don't like that, oddly enough. Um, but then I went on to talk about how humor releases endorphins into the brain. Endorphins are like the brain's natural painkillers, right? So when we're laughing, we're actually self-medicating, um, which, you know, is a natural high. It's great. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I came to the conclusion, well, just about my dad. So my dad is a Holocaust survivor. He had a very difficult childhood. Um, and so he has a particular relationship with death, right? a very uncomfortable relationship with death. Laughing at funerals is his way of coping. And I realized that laughing at the bad things in life is everybody's way of coping. So, you know, I hope now, in hindsight, you know, that my humor and ability to make people laugh helps them get through whatever traumas they're going through in their lives. Because you were working in uh, books and radio, do you think about physical humor when you write? Do you think about the physicality, or is it almost strictly uh, words and words in a row? Well, so as an undergraduate, um, I actually took um, three years of screenwriting. And during that period, uh, I, there was a period of about a decade where I was doing nothing but writing screenplays. I wrote about 100 scripts. Um, and of course, that is very visual, right? Screenplays uh, have to um, incorporate that, especially science fiction screenplays, which I wrote a lot of, because, of course, you're dealing with um, worlds that are not the world around us, so you have to describe what is going to be on the screen. 
Um, so yes, there has always been, because I have that in my background, there's always been a visual element uh, to my prose writing when I went back to it. So the other thing is, we, we have actually got some of these on, on the stage, amazing stories. Now, okay, so tell me about your involvement with this magazine. <laughs> well, so I was always looking for ways of promoting my writing, and I had heard that Amazing Stories had a website. So I went and started doing book reviews for them. Um, and, you know, after the book review, and Ira Naiman is also a writer, and here's where you can find his stuff. Um, I did that for about a year and a half, and then Steve Davidson, who was the publisher at Amazing Stories, uh, who is the publisher at Amazing Stories, um, he, his wife, got cancer and he had to move away from the website to deal with her. Um, and he asked me to edit the website for him. Um, and I said, yes, I'd, I'd be happy to do that, but I would appreciate it because I knew that his end game was always to public, re recreate the print magazine as a fiction magazine. The website was mostly nonfiction. I said, if you do eventually get the magazine going, I'd like to have some editorial role. Uh, I edited the website for a year and a half. Um, so I've now, you know, volunteered for this organization for about three years. Uh, and it just, it was a matter of luck that he did in fact recreate the magazine and I thought that, you know, he would get a professional editor and that I would sort of be working with whoever that person was in a junior capacity. Uh, but he asked me to edit and I was like, well, I can do that, sure. Um, and really that's, that's how it came to be. And what I take from this story is, is that any sort of success is a question of both luck and work. Right, because he wouldn't have asked me to do it if I hadn't put in the work of the three years of volunteering. But at the same time, I just happened to be there when he needed somebody. And that, I think, was, was just a matter of fortune. So you're in a unique position, because you're writing, and you're writing comedy, speculative fiction, and now you're an editor. So what are the sort of trends, what are sort of the things that you feel that writers are, are dealing with? Uh, in terms of subject matter, because yeah, mean, just well, even in tone, because I found you know that the, well, your tone obviously is humor. Are we seeing more of that, or are we are are we reading angry stories? Because I'm reading a lot of very angry stories right now, so and a lot of horror. It seems to me to be as a general consumer right. of speculative fiction, I'm seeing a rise in horror. Well, so we talked about what kind of magazine we wanted. Um, for maybe six months to a year before we actually started producing the magazine. And one of the things uh, in response to what you were saying, what you just said was, yeah, we were not really thrilled with the dark turn that science fiction has taken over the past decade, 15 years. We grew up with science fiction in the 60s. We grew up with Star Trek, let's be honest. And, um, but not just Star Trek. And, and science fiction was more hopeful then. And that's something that we really wanted to get back to. As a humor writer, I put a high value on both humor and just fun generally. So we wanted a magazine that wasn't dark and gloomy, but was a, a fun thing to read. So all of those things went into uh, what we've been producing. I'll also say that one of the trends that I'm very heartened by is um, the movement to diversity. So for instance, um, we try to have gender parity. You'll find as many stories by women as you will by men. Uh, we try to get um, people of other ethnicities, of, of marginalized groups generally. Um, and my feeling is that science fiction in the last decade but, mm. Science fiction for a long time had been somewhat conservative and stagnant, um, and bringing in these new voices is going to reinvigorate the genre in, in ways that excite me and I hope excite readers. Well, it's always been a cycle. You know, you look at the mid-60s yeah. and you've got the rise of people like Ursula K. Le Guin and Harlan Ellison and, you know, you know people who are, are Chip Delaney, pushing diversity, pushing all kinds of... Um, you know, the, the, it felt the universes were expanding, even in a literary way, the way things were written. And I'm fi mm -hmm. I now find the trend is towards a much um, 
frankly, the books that are better written. There's a lot of interest in literary science fiction. And now, yes, we've always had people like Margaret Atwood in the field, but Ian McEwan has just written a book that is essentially science fiction. Um, but he's disavowing science fiction as if it isn't. So do you yeah. see that as a long struggle that you sort of, as an editor, constantly have to fight? Well, it's, it's funny because often at conventions when we talk about the history of science fiction, people talk about particularly the, the uh, literary science fiction of the 60s and 70s as a wrong turn, right? As there was a lot of experimental stuff that, you know, the, the average science fiction reader who really wants their, their plots and, and characters to be so, so... Uh, part of the, the stories, um, they feel that that was all wrong. But as you say, once with Swindlem swung back to narrative fiction, it still maintained a lot of literary qualities. And I think that's great, right? Yeah. I, I really like that because, you know, I'm not interested in the cardboard characters of the previous generations. One of the most difficult things uh, that I've had to do as editor of Amazing Stories, uh, I'm sure anybody who sees this is going to know this, but just in case they don't, um, Amazing Stories was the first science fiction magazine, purely science fiction magazine. Started by Hugo Gernsback, the first issue was April 1926, um, and they published Jules Verne and H.G. Wells and some of the big names of the time. But they also published a lot of authors who are really not well known anymore, and probably justifiably so, because the values, the literary values that we look for now were not there then, right? And so my problem as editor of this magazine is how do I respect the history of the magazine while also making a magazine for a 21st century reader? Um, and my take on it is, yeah, to take the best of the 21st century and say, okay, we are pioneering it now in the way that Gernsback was pioneering it then. Very different product, very different stories, uh, but that same sense of going into a, a new direction and going somewhere new. Uh, how do you feel that science fiction is going now that the, we have got this incredible media explosion, uh, particularly on film, of all these science fiction ideas and tropes, and so much on television. When we grew up, there might be Star Trek for three years. There might be Planet of the Apes. So there's very, very uh, small amount on film and television of science fiction. Now, there seems to be a show every single day. Well, I've, I've written for TV and film, so I'm not going to knock them, but there is nothing like immersing yourself in a literary world, right? And the problem is I'm not sure that the film and TV explosion, as much as I love it, as much as, as, as it is, um, is actually helping bring people to the books or the magazines or whatever. <clears throat> and really that, again, I would not say no if anybody wanted to adapt my books for TV or whatever, right? Of course. Um, but print is now my love. And so I wish it would make more people interested in the literary end of it. Well, speak, going back to books, um, one of the things that struck me about your work is that you use a lot of um, typographical tricks. You use different typefaces, you set up your pages in different ways. Why did you want to do that? Oh, I, well, the main reason is because it's funny, right? It, it allows me another way of getting laughs out of the reader, right? Uh, what I usually say is that, um, that I'm not afraid to drop my pants to get a laugh. I will do the sort of silly, obvious things. Um, and then there'll be the more subtle, satirical things as well. So, you know, my books uh, can be entered into at whatever level the reader wants to enter into them, right? Um, but yeah, uh, I also think that typography is just, it's a lost art. And I think that it can be so expressive. I'll give you a, a great example from my second book. So my second book, 
um, uses about 12 different typefaces, which horrifies most publishers these days, right? Um, but there is one area in particular where there is um, an artificial intelligence. And the artificial intelligence was um, created using the theory of um, society of the mind, the Marvin Minsky idea that there are dozens of different modules and they all fight it out to determine what the uh, overall behavior of the thing is going to be. So this is a character who has maybe eight voices, eight or nine voices, right? And it's all the same character. And I was thinking, so how do I express that these are different parts of this one character speaking? Um, and the, the solution I came upon was give them each a different typeface and a typeface that actually represents kind of the one character characteristic that I want the reader to get, right? So uh, one of the things that I, I try to make clear to, to people is that although I do these funky things, there's always a motivation for them. There's always a reason within the narrative why these things get done. And it's funny. So have you ever been inspired by a typo? God, yes. Well, thank you for bringing that up. Um, so this is a story, of, you know, people ask, so where do you get your ideas? And the thing is, everywhere and anywhere. And this is my favorite example, although I have others. Um, I used to be a member of a science fiction book club here in, uh, not here, we're not here, but in Toronto, where I live. And each month, we would be assigned a different book, and then we'd read it, and we'd all come together and uh, discuss it for an hour, uh, actually uh, in the basement at Back of Books. And one month, the book uh, that was listed on the website was The Dragons of Bagel by Michael Swanwick. And I thought, man, that's an awesome title. I am so eager, I'm so stoked to read this book. Um, and anybody who's familiar with Michael Swanwick's work will know that that is not the name of his book. His book is actually called The Dragons of Babel. Uh, it was a typo on the website. And I needed to get over my disappointment, but once I did get over my disappointment, I thought, ooh, that's an awesome title, and now nobody's ever used it. So in my second novel, there is a chapter called The Dragon, the Dragon of the Bagel, and it does, in fact, have both a dragon and a delicatessen. So our, my final question to you, so what advice do you have for young writers and people starting out as your background in, well, obviously writer, but obviously editor now. So what, what advice would you have for a young aspiring writer of science fiction or speculative fiction? Well, there's a lot. I mean, the first thing is develop a thick skin, okay? Um, I've had six novels published. I've had maybe a dozen short stories published in anthologies. Um, they say, I heard, you know, when I was starting out, I heard that you can't consider yourself a writer until you've had at least 100 rejections. I figure by that criterion, I must be a writer three times over at least, right? You're going to get rejected. It's going to happen a lot. Learn to live with it however you can. Um, another thing, and, and we were talking about this uh, before we started the interview, another thing is plan on spending 30 or 40 years of your life doing it. And there is no guarantee after all of that work that you will be successful, however you define success. Um, but you have to love writing. You have to love it. If you don't love writing, you're not gonna be able to sustain yourself for the 30 or 40 years, assuming that, like most of us, you don't become famous or wealthy from it. Um, but, as I point out, if you do love it, and if you're motivated to do it for that length of time, 30 or 40 years down the road, you may or may not become famous, you may or may not become wealthy, but you've spent your life doing something you love, and that's not something a lot of people can say either. So, there you go. Great way to end. Thank you very much, Ira. That Ira Naiman, everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs>